Hi, I'm Richard Paul Evans. Uh, welcome, welcome to um, our webcast here. Um, I'm the author of the Michael Vay series, and I'm glad to have some of our Vaniacs there. The contest um, that we have today is sponsored by Simon & Schuster and Boys Life Magazine. And let me begin by telling you a, a little bit about myself. The first book I wrote, I was 29 years old at the time, and it was a book called The Christmas Box. And your parents might know this book. You might have seen it. It was made into a movie. And this was something I did um, at the time I was working at an ad agency. And I did it just for fun as a gift for my family. And so, and so I was also, um, I didn't have great expectations. I thought I would be writing radio and TV commercials my whole life. And I was, I was receiving so many requests for the book. So when I was done, I went out and I, I have one of the originals here. This is one of the phone calls from bookstores who wanted a copy of my of my books to sell. So I sent it out to publishers and the publishers all rejected my book. None of them wanted it. They didn't think it would sell. It was different than what a lot of people were seeing or selling at the time. So um, I self-published the book and this is what the self-published book looked like. And it started to grow and it grew bigger and bigger and pretty soon I had sold more than 8 million copies. By the time I wrote the Michael Vay series, I had written 18, uh, 18 novels, and none of them were, were for young adults. Michael Vay was something I wrote for the joy and the fun of it. And so, um, the first time, the first book I wrote was actually when I first wrote Michael Vay. I didn't tell anyone that I was one of. Um, a, a, my publisher wasn't really, really excited about it because I wasn't writing young adult books and they weren't sure how the book would go. And so when we, um, when I tried to sell it to get it published, I had a little trouble finding a publisher. And then a radio show host named Glenn Beck, he got a hold of the book and he gave it to his agent who did something really smart. He walked across the street and he gave it to a 13 year old boy. And he said, when you finish reading the book, why don't you come back and, and let me know what you think of the book, thinking it would be a week or two before the kid actually read the book. The boy ended up on his doorstep the next morning or the next afternoon, and he said, I stayed up all night and read the book. It's the best book I've ever read. At that point, he said, uh, the, Glenn's agent called Glenn and said, I think we may have something here. And so he, he called me and said, I want to publish the book. And so when we actually brought it out, the book debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list and began having a big following. Now, what, one thing that was very strange about it is because my readers were adults, the first readers were pretty much adults. So when I'd go to book signings, they would, they would be about 90% adults and 10% youth. And I saw that start to change. And so the next year, when I came out with book two, which is Michael Vay, Rise of the Elgin, uh, I started to notice that it was about 50-50, that uh, a lot of youth and a lot of adults still. This changed with book three. And by the time Battle of the Empire came out, then it was a whole different matter. We got ready for our launch party, and we decided to have a party when I released this book. And we didn't know how many people would come. We were surprised that close to 3,000 people came to the lunch party. And so it was a madhouse. It was my biggest book signing ever, ever in my, in my history. So it, it's actually been pretty exciting to watch, the, um, watch this book grow. Now, it's actually going around the world. And I'll, I'll show you some different versions. This is a version that came out this year. And it's only sold at Walmart. Uh, it's pretty cool. It, it has the first two books together. So this has The Prisoner of Cell 25 and Rise of the Elgin. We also have this version. This is the version in China. So it's in Chinese. You'll, you'll see the difference between this one and the American version is they, they added a girl. <laughs> okay, they put Taylor in the cell. As you know, if you've read the book, Taylor's never in the cell with Michael, but they just thought 
putting the girl in there would sell more books, I think. So that's how we ended up with, um, with that Chinese version. Uh, one of the questions I'm asked a lot is why do I, why does Michael have Tourette syndrome? And some of you may not know what Tourette syndrome is. Tourette syndrome is a neurological disorder that's characterized by, uh, by tics and uncontrolled behavior. Sometimes you see it on TV and you find people might be swearing or saying, saying things that kind of involuntarily just come out. That's only about 10% of those with Tourette syndrome who, who swear like that. That's called coprolalia. Um, it's, it's a Michael Vey bracelet, electric clan bracelet, and I always give it to the kids who come to my book signings who have Tourette syndrome or, or Asperger's or some form of autism. And because I, I want them to, to know that they're part of the electric clan, Michael Vey is a little bit of a metaphor in that, <coughs> that the book is really about the electricity we have inside of all, inside of, all of us. So um, we, we got a lot of questions that were sent in, um, almost a thousand. And so I'm going to answer just a few of them here. And if I read your name and when you called in, you win a, a book from, an autographed book from Simon & Schuster. Okay, so we'll start. The first question came, it's uh, 1400 macro. 1400 macro. The question is, will there be a Michael Vay movie? And this is, this is a good question and one that I think about a lot. We've had uh, close to a dozen offers for movies. I could sell the movie rights to have a movie, but we want to make sure the movie's done right. Um, I know that there's been some major movies done recently. Uh, in talking to you, uh, some of you said, well, you know, I, I didn't like what they did with Percy Jackson, for instance. That the movie wasn't as good as the books. Or Twilight. Um, it's very important to me that the movie is done right. So we're going to be patient and make sure we have the right uh, producer before we start. Okay, the second question, it, uh, it's 920 Maggie, and she said, I love to write, but I don't know what the first step is to get published. How do I get started? Well, the key, Maggie, is to make sure you have a book. And that might sound kind of obvious, but most of the people who come to me and say they want to be a writer don't even have a book. And it really is about the book. They're not, when publishers bring a writer, they're not hiring a writer. They're buying rights to a book. And so even if you're a great writer, remember that it was this version. And so I actually had to go out and do um, 7,000 copies to get started. And so that was a big risk. Okay, question number three. And this is 1554 Adam. 1554 Adam. Is Michael Vay based on anyone in real life? And to some degree, yes. I mean, not on anyone electric, uh, but it, it's based on on my life experiences as having Tourette syndrome and also on my son, Michael, who also has Tourette syndrome. And so I wanted to capture that experience so that, um, so, so that, I could live out the fantasy of when I was that little kid who was getting bullied. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have electricity, which I wish I had. So, <coughs> okay, next question. It's 2221 Katie. What made you want to become a writer? Uh, I, I just liked writing. And it, you either like to write or you don't, I find. So for some people, that's, that's like the worst thing you can ask them to do. And you know, ask them if they want to write, and it's, it sounds like a, a great task. And sometimes it is, uh, it is a lot of work and not a lot of fun. Uh, but in this case, um, I just enjoyed the ability to create. And that's why Michael Vay is the most fun I have writing, because with Michael Vay, I'm actually creating a fantasy world. I'm creating, I'm creating people and places and organizations that don't, that only exist in, in here. And so, um, that's that's what makes it fun. That's what makes me want to be a writer. Okay, the next question comes from is 1526 Alex. What is your daily work schedule like? I am my schedule is very unpredictable. 
I'm very unpredictable. I actually just got back from um, driving the entire state of Florida from coast to coast, from, from actually the top in Folkestone, Georgia, down along the beach, all the way down to Key West. And I was doing research for a book I'm writing that comes out next spring that's for adults. It's not my Michael Bay series. And so my time and the, the, what I do changes a lot. I find myself, you know, if I'm not writing, uh, I do a lot of promotion or do events like this or radio promotion. Uh, and then, of course, I'm a father and I have five children, and that takes uh, a good amount of time as well. So uh, I, I'm not one of these writers who gets up at six in the morning, writes for three hours, eats breakfast, and then comes back and and writes for another three hours and then calls it a day. I, I don't have a set schedule. I probably would do a lot better if I did, um, but I don't. I, I just don't work that way. One of the reasons is because I have, um, with my Tret syndrome, I also have attention deficit disorder, and so I, I just kind of have to write when, when uh, the spirit moves me. Okay, next question. This is 1131 Akintundi. Will you be writing another series after Michael Vay is over? I don't know. That's ask me in four years. Uh, it's a lot of work and a lot can change in four years. Uh, I, it will be sad when the series is over, uh, but fortunately I don't have to worry about it for a while. So we'll, we'll see. Okay, next question is 104RJ. Who are your favorite authors and do they help you decide what kind of books you wanted to write? The first time I really thought of being a writer, I was in Monterey, California, which is where the book Cannery Row, written by John Steinbeck, takes place. And I was reading Cannery Row. I'd never read it. And there's something about the way John Steinbeck wrote that sounded like my own voice. And when I heard it, I thought, I understand this guy. I just I just get it. And I, I, I just love the book. And so um, that was the first time I, I sat down with a pencil and paper, and I just start writing and to, to write a story. And that's where it started. Because of my attention deficit, I always had um, a little bit of trouble being focused in writing and even doing my homework. And so um, I was actually put in the lowest reading group in first grade. And so I didn't have a lot of confidence in my reading ability, let alone my writing ability. And it wasn't until the eighth grade I came across a book that I had heard people talk about, but I had avoided because it was thick. And the book was called The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. And when I read that book, I, I it was the first time I had really gotten addicted to a book, and it was a, a book that big, and I just couldn't wait to read. And that's that's and as soon as I finished that, I start writing fantasy. So the first thing I actually wrote, the first writings I did for a book were all actually fantasy, even though it took me is is fantasy actually. To read, it's nonfiction. I love reading biographies. I love reading about people's lives. And so I actually don't read a lot of novels. Um, even though sometimes I think the biographies are seem more fantastic than the novels themselves. Okay, next question, 1644, Jeremy. Jeremy says, I love to write short stories. So do you have any advice on how to write a good story? Um, it's all about the voice. There was a joke that I heard once. These 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 men were. This man is brought into prison, and it's first day in prison. And someone walks someone walks into the room and says twenty seven, and everyone bursts out laughing. And then someone says fourteen, and everyone starts laughing. And someone says eighteen, and everyone starts laughing. And and, and the new prisoner says, I don't understand. Why is everyone laughing? And another. Another uh, inmate says, said, we've been here so long that, and we know the jokes, that we, um, we don't even tell the jokes anymore. We just have them all numbered. So we just say the number for the joke. And the man says, oh, so you just say a number and everyone laughs. And he goes, yeah. And so he goes, 11. And no one, no one laughs. And he looks around and he goes, how come no one laughed? And he said, I'm sorry, some people just don't know, know how to tell a joke. This is what it's like writing books, 
Okay, so if you're writing a short story, it's very important that you're writing something that is so engaging that they can't put it down. If you were to sit down with your friend and start telling this story that you're going to write down, and you see him checking his watch and he's you know looking away and don't bother, you know you you've lost him already. If you're telling him the story and he's going what? And then if you were to stop in the middle of it, he goes, no, you can't stop. Finish, finish. Okay, then you have a story. That's how you tell a story. It's not a whole lot different than that voice that you're talking, you're talking to someone with. So that's what's important. If, if, if you're losing people right off, you know, it's, especially in a short story, you can't let them go at all, ever. Okay, um, next question. 1224, Aaron, do you feel like you're in the world of your books when you're writing them? I, I like this question, Aaron. I, I like it because the answer is absolutely. When I'm in the jungle, for instance, uh, running with Michael and, and, his, and Tessa, Tessa and, and you know the experience they've had. First of all, I've been in the jungle. I spent time in the jungle doing research. And to actually feel that it's, it's it's really a strange thing to spend the day in the jungle and then come out and go to lunch or go somewhere with my wife it feels very strange because part of me is still in the jungle it's like moving in between the two worlds if you don't have that experience I don't think you can write a very good book you know I just don't think that it's that it's real and so uh the more absorbed I am in the book and the more I believe in it, the, the better the book. So in some, some level, in some degree, all books are really about, about me because I have to be the character inside the book. Okay, uh, next question. It says, 1944, Andrew, how did you come up with the idea of electric children? You know, that's a good question. I, I have always been a superhero fan, like big time. Uh, I came from a family that didn't have much money, and so I would I would go door to door, and I would um, I would rake leaves and mow lawns, and they, they would pay me. They didn't pay a lot back then; it'd be like fifty cents. And but then I'd go down and to a Seven Eleven and and buy a comic book, and maybe some Doritos, and and it's like that was pretty much the best night of my life. You know, the night when I got a brand new Spider Man comic book or the beast or iron man and so I, i've always been a fan of superheroes some of the some of the powers they have are exciting as a kid you want some not so much and, and so as i was looking at michael i actually changed through different powers and and i i, <coughs> I honestly don't remember the day that i decided that i wanted it to be electricity and I, I don't remember when that actually happened. Um, I wish I did. I wish I had written in my journal or something. But um, I just kind of stumbled across it and started playing around with it. And I thought, well, this would be an interesting power to have. And and then as I started thinking about the book in terms of how he got his power and the other kids having special powers, I realized that if I tied everything into electricity, that, that the series would have this uh, pun intended, you know, it would be electric it would have this um, this electric, electric feel about it. And there are so many ways that electricity is used that it became almost like a science lesson. So I've actually had science teachers come out and say thank you for for writing these books because it's gotten my kids interested in, in electricity and science. It also, um, it also the, the book has also won a national award from, from the National Science Teachers Association. And so... Uh, I, I, I'm glad I, I settled with electricity and their powers. And I, uh, I'm, I'm often asked if I could have any power, you know, whose power would I have? Would it be Michael or who would it be? And what I've come up with is I think I would like to be Taylor if I could have any power. Uh, it, it could, I think it would be the most practical because if you go around shocking people, you're going to get in trouble. And, you're, and essentially you're hurting people. Uh, with, with Taylor, you're much more discreet. And so imagine being at the presidential debates. You could just sit there and 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 you could actually um, you could actually change the course of history, you know, if you did that. So, um, okay, next question. 
This is 814 Jace. Do you like writing fiction for boys better than writing fiction for adults? And the answer is absolutely yes, I do. It is, there, there is much more energy. To go to a book signing with a thousand screaming boys is, is just a lot of fun. And even if you had a thousand adults come, they're not going to be screaming. It's not going to be the same energy. So I'm having much more fun writing uh, a series for youth than I was with uh, writing for adults. Okay, last question. This is um, 1418 Michael. And it, this is interesting because it shows Michael was really thinking. He said, if all the kids came to, came to be from the same process, why do they have different powers? Good question, Michael. Well, just in the same way that every child born comes to the same process, um, no one looks the same, right? I mean, we're all different. Um, the things that make us affect us differently, we all have different DNA in it. So no one looks exactly alike or thinks exactly alike. And so the electricity affected them differently. In the case of Michael with Tourette's syndrome, uh, he was especially affected uh, different. And as you'll find as you go through the series, that, that is one of the reasons he's so valuable to the Elgin in figuring out why the kids are the way they are. In the next book uh, that's coming out next September, uh, book four of the Michael Vay series, you will, you'll get to know a little bit more why they are the way they are. So, um, all right. Well, that's, that's the questions. Thank you for reading. Uh, I, I'm, I love my Vaniacs and, um, thanks for sharing with others, sharing the books and you're still the innovators, even though we have, uh, more than a million copies in print, it's still growing. And, uh, there's some parts of the country I found where, where a lot of people still haven't heard of the series. And so thank you for sharing with others. If you'd like to be more of a Vaniac, there's a couple things you can do. One, you can go to uh, Facebook, go to the Michael Vay page, and join. We, we post uh, interesting facts and things there. So if you're on Facebook, go to Michael Vay. And the second thing is if um, you can go to Amazon.com and post a review. And uh, let others know how you, how you feel about the Michael Vay series. So uh, again, I want to say thank you so much for joining me this evening. It's been a lot of fun. And I, if uh, you go to my website, which is richardpaulevans.com, um, I can let you know when you can see when I'll be in your area for a book signing or a speaking event. And uh, I look forward to, to meeting you someday. Again, thanks so much for tuning in. And I hope we have this chat one other, you know, again sometime. Thanks.